Hello everyone, welcome to the Korean Pavilion. Uh, we're going to start the session soon. And I'll just introduce the moderator, Dr. Ali Raza. And then they'll be introducing themselves and carrying on with the conversation. So, Dr. Ali Raza specializes in the history of modern South Asia. His work appeared in comparative studies of South Africa, Afri South Asia, Africa and the Middle East. South Asia Journal of South Asian History and Culture in Contemporary Sa uh, South Asia. So, um, we'll begin the talk now and all of them can introduce themselves and then get carry on with the conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a very generous introduction. Um, Assalamualaikum, uh, friends. Thank you very much for your attention. Our panel for today, uh, as you know, is uh, called Education as Ideology. Um, and just by way of uh, prefacing, uh, I suppose, some of the things that we'll be discussing, uh, this is uh, a theme, this is a question that is very close uh, to all of us uh, as teachers, as instructors, uh, because we often uh, find ourselves uh, trying to make our students unlearn uh, what they have learned uh, in uh, their schools uh, and in their textbooks. Uh, and so this is something that we keep on kind of like thinking about uh, in our capacity as, as, as educators. Uh, and so uh, to my left uh, is my colleague Ali Usman Kasmi. Uh, he's a historian. Uh, he also teaches at LAMS. Uh, Tanya Saeed, is, uh, she teaches in the School of Education. In the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. And she has specialized in education. Yeah, That's the correct. <laughs> uh, Anusha Balek, uh, to her left, is also a historian. Uh, she is also in the School of Humanities and, and Social Sciences. Uh, and last but not the least is Dishad Ashraf. Uh, she is, uh, is affiliated with, the, with AKU IED uh, and she has conducted some fascinating research which I hope Dilshad Abadaj will, will be speaking about in the, duration, uh, in, in the course of our uh, discussion. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, I suppose the first question that I want to begin with is, uh, uh, is directing uh, you know, a query to Ali Osman Kasmi and his recent research. Um, into textbooks and how, uh, you know, textbooks uh, as part of the initial kind of like education policy that was introduced in Pakistan uh, became a vehicle, uh, as it were, uh, to promote a certain kind of narrative. Uh, uh, Ali, could you take it off? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think the, the important thing to note here is that people often assume as if um, changes in textbooks started taking place in the 1980s which is, uh, you know, uh, certain changes did happen and there has been an uh, ongoing process since then. But whatever gets incorporated in these textbooks and which is projected as an ideology, it also has a prehistory, which in some ways dates back to the late 19th, early 20th century, which is the formative period of Muslim nationalism. And a certain kind of an imagination of the Muslim community in India and uh, a projection of its past uh, and connection that it tries to make with, with, with Mughal India and the search for a sovereign a subject uh, in South Asia, specifically in the context of uh, British colonialism. Um, so there is a great deal of fascination where the, the figure of Auden for example, uh, focus on the exclusivity of Muslim community in South Asia um, and is general kind of a suspicion towards Akbar as that figure which, uh, whose policies try to, you know, dissolve this kind of, of bonds, um, um, you know, separate uh, entities between the Hindu and the Muslim community in South Asia. So it is starting from this, the, that particular historical narrative, which is Muslim-centric, and which is this quest for Muslim sovereign subject in South Asia. It starts from late 19th century, it gets uh, developed in the 20th, and then it's co-opted in the post colonial period for the status project of building Pakistan as, uh, and you know, transforming uh, subjects into citizens uh, who, are, who sort of are, are taught this, this history. So if you, if you look at the, the earliest instances of, of education planning in Pakistan, which starts as early as 1948 when Jinnah was alive as well, and from that first instance or conference which was held, the ideology, the term ideology has been used, and the ideology of Islam is, uh, has been said to be the, the cornerstone of, of Pakistan's existence. And it was emphasized that it should be incorporated in, in textbooks. And so I'll be focusing mostly on, on how it was done in case of history textbooks. Uh, and Tanya will be talking about Urdu textbooks. So to begin with, I mean, there was a brief period of transition um, where the, the new state was struggling to, to, to develop curriculum or to publish textbooks. So in some cases, there was a continuation of textbooks which were published 
or printed during the colonial period. And they continued to be taught uh, at least till the early 1950s. And, uh, and then by then there were a group of Pakistani historians who came together and they developed a textbook <laughs> sponsored by the government of Pakistan. And it was called, I think, A History of uh, Hind Pakistan. And eventually, the, 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 the fundamental problem was that, you know, the, the imagination of Pakistan as, as, a, on, as based on Muslim nationalism, uh, but that imagination of Muslim nationalism was largely based, or had, had the center or its roots in the cultural historical traditions of North India, a region which had to be abandoned, sorry, which had to be abandoned for the establishment of the new sovereign state of, of Pakistan. So there was a clear dis, uh, disconnect between the new territorial boundaries of Pakistan and the, the cultural imagination which provided the basis for that nationalism to emerge in the first place. So how to scale that circle in a way. Um, so in the 1960s then, there was a, a government body which was set up, which was uh, headed by I.H. Qureshi, who was one of the, the major historians of Muslim South Asia, and joined by a number of other historians as well. And they were provided with this concept note that you have to write the history of Pakistan in such a way which does not emphasize the centrality of Indian mainland and you have to show present-day Pakistan, which was at that time West Pakistan and East Pakistan, as the center of activity. So whatever movement in history is happening according to that document, that movement was happening from uh, Northwest towards Central India, uh, towards North India, and that movement was always that of a militaristic kind of annexing India, of capturing India, and producing that India as a kind of a military conquest of Muslim invading armies, and in some cases, in the pre-Muslim past as well. That provided the basis uh, for, um, you know, the sort of meta-narrative or master narrative for, for Pakistan's history. And in that meta-narrative, it was not to be called the history of Indian subcontinent or indo pak or history of Hind Pakistan, as it was previously called till the 1950s. It was simply to be called history of Pakistan. So that provided this disconnect and it was then incorporated and replicated in various uh, textbooks which were then, uh, which were then produced. Uh, eventually in the 1980s, uh, the decisive break which you find in the 1980s is that it's completely sort of uh, uh, not looking towards India at all and the, the orientation is towards Central Asia, uh, towards Arabia. And Central Asia comes in, it becomes more important, uh, in fact, in the early 90s with uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of uh, Central Asian Muslim republics. So a new connection is being sought with, uh, with Central Asia with a sort of um, obvious um, a pretext that it's, that it's the South Central Asian region from where, you know, Muslim armies were invading or Sufi Sultanats were coming from there, trade networks were established. Uh, and that was a project which was then um, carried forward by A.H. Dani, for example. Um, and then as an extension of that, it's establishing connection uh, with, uh, with, with the Arab world. So now if you pick up any textbook, Pakistani textbook, it talks about the geography, geographical location of Pakistan and uh, the, the geography extends to cover Middle East and the connection that Pakistan has with the Middle East without any uh, link or, or description of, of South Asia as such, which was previously the most important uh, part of, uh, of any textbook or any history textbook which was being taught. Um, and one last thing is the, uh, there are a couple of things actually, but you know, the, uh, for, for a very long period of time, you know, ever since these changes were made, um, critics were pointing out that the, one of the major problems with the history textbooks in Pakistan is that it starts with a Muslim period, that it starts with Muhammad bin Qasim or Mahmud Ghaznavi or whatever. I'm not even talking about the, what's wrong with that logical content, which is that that's a separate issue altogether. But you know, the major concern was that why do you ignore Indus Valley civilization or Gandhara and all of that? And which is a very interesting debate in itself because in, in India, uh, it would be, you know, the Hindu right wing which would emphasize the importance of Indus Valley. In Pakistan, it's the other way around. It's the, the, the Pakistan liberal who wants to connect with the Indus Valley because of various difference in context. That's a huge difference in context. Uh, but now in the new textbooks which have been revised and which are a product of a guideline which was prepared in 2006, I don't know if it has been revised since then, but I've seen the textbooks 
so they have included Indus Valley, they have included Gandhara, but it's it's not just the inclusion, it's the, the way they have been discussed. Uh, in fact, the way it's, it discusses all that history from Indus Valley up to the present day, um, and the kind of, uh, you know, detachment from, from any kind of, of critical assessment or enabling students the kind of necessary tools required to understand the complexities of a historical process, that's where, you know, the real uh, problem lies. And uh, history, despite all these tall claims being made, uh, that we are revising curriculum, that we are taking content out of it, which is problematic, it still continues to, to shape a particular kind of, a, of an ideological, uh, ideological worldview. Thank you. Uh, that was a very comprehensive overview, Ali. Um, uh, Tania, you have done a lot of work in Urdu. Ki nisabi ke pe. Um, so, I mean, simply put, I mean, do we find a similar story in Urdu textbooks? Yes, yeah, so Urdu becomes... It's, it's quite an interesting case because Urdu essentially is where the union between Islamiyat and Pakistan studies and history takes place. That's mm. what it is, exactly. in essence. Mm. And it's it's right. also interesting to study Urdu the way it's sort of conceptualized uh, by the government, by the textbook boards, because that's where you see the teaching of a national language, not just a language. And that distinction becomes important, because that's where you see all these sort of ideological narratives coming through. And what you find is, first of all, there is a general uh, curriculum and syllabus that dictates what those themes are, what those narratives are across Urdu textbooks. And then those have been, after the 18th Amendment, been differently interpreted, interpreted within textbooks across different boards. And, and what in my work, what I found is Punjab, which is not surprising, is obviously taking the lead in reforms. Some of them have been positive, but a lot of them have actually reinforced a more conservative ideology, which you don't find in uh, the uh, in books produced by other text uh, ex other textbook boards. The example of these themes are obviously an emphasis on Islamic values. Now, with Islamic values, normally you're given a structure, like your Urdu textbook has a particular structure, there has to be a hamd, a poem in praise of God, there has to be a naat, a poem in praise of the Prophet, there has to be narratives about figures of, of Islam, there has to be narratives about figures of uh, Pakistan and nationalism and all of that. But the extent to which you see a normalization of, you know, uh, this whole idea of Islamic values can be see, seen in a very basic example. Jo 2017 to 18 ki kitabein thi, usme jab muzakkar moines ki baat karte hain, they go directly to it, right? Grammar. 2018 to 19 mein ek unhone sentence add kiya hai ke Allah Taala ne jodiyan banayi hain, aur wo hoti hai muzakkar aur moines. So you see the extent to which there is a normalization of Islamic values in each and everything you read. And this is your Urdu textbook. There is obviously an emphasis, and we can go on, I mean there's so many other examples. But this is, and this was Punjab textbook board, and you see this more uh, with, with their books. Then around uh, when it comes to this idea of patriotism and a very uncritical ideal of patriotism. Now, if you have a argument, what is the argument? You know, you have to say that you have to say that you have to so uncritical that at grade one, you limit the imagination of a child to certain roles. Again, an example of a grade one textbook from the Punjab textbook board is this narrative which you ask the children what will you do for your country? What will you do for Pakistan? They don't ask the children what you want to do for your country. And then there's a narrative that a girl says that I will join a forge, a soldier. A girl says that I will become a doctor, a child says that I will become a farmer, and a girl says that I will become a teacher. I will be a teacher. So if you think about it, all that's required in sustaining the nation state, in sustaining the concept of nationalism is right there. So from a very young age, you're sort of, you know, it's a prescriptive idea of what it means to be a, a citizen also comes in. Citizen maybe, mind you, the narratives in our Urdu textbooks, mein hai, it's all about your duty to the state. It's never about the state's responsibility towards you. If you talk about the safari, then you're a good citizen. You don't think that where is the state coming from? And we we'll can get into this later if you like, as far as changes around um, our national action plan, there were some changes in resilience and tolerance, which the Punjab textbook board has implemented. In that, it's all about citizen responsibility. So it's all about citizen working with the state so that we can protect you know, everyone. So, I, I, I mean, those, as far as patriotism 
etc. goes even in terms of your family, family values. There's a heteronormative ideal around what it means to be a family, how it's extended. Then Punjab specific thing you get is that if there are social campaigns, whether it's on dengue, whether it's on child protection, that's the narrative of the book in the end. The book cover that you have, the back of the book cover, will have a narrative or a message for the general public over there as well. So your Urdu textbook in essence has become, you know, a, a means to which the state sort of communicates its ideology. But I feel it's more dangerous because that's where the child has the ability to imagine beyond. Because you're given the vocabulary to think, right? right? You be, uh, to express yourself. Right. That's where the Urdu textbook is. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, Anusha, if I can come to you, um, because often I feel that sometimes we tend to fixate uh, on textbooks uh, a lot, actually. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you can take a step back and think about uh, the education system um, as a whole. Uh, and I'm asking you this because uh, you have worked uh, with Christian communities in the whole. Um, uh, I mean, tell us what that problem is. I mean, um, so actually, that's exactly what I'd be interested in talking about. That um, so I've spent um, a year, most of 2017, gathering uh, oral histories of Christians in Lahore. Uh, mainly focusing in Yohanabad. And for me at that point, education was kind of tangential to the larger project, which was supposed to be about political exclusion. But it turns out that access to education is very difficult in ways that are ideologically connected, but also not. Let me explain what I mean. So as a historian, obviously, I will start with the past. And so if you think about the ideology and the dominant narrative that we've heard of from Kasmi and from uh, Tanya, what we've heard is that there is a dominant narrative that is exclusionary, but that, um, I want to say, has also very direct, real social effects um, in how it is that people feel Pakistani in their everyday lives. Um, and I think that the, that story really starts with how we understand ideology. Uh, there is not one state ideology that exists that we can reach out and touch and say, this is Pakistani. There were variations of it, we chose one, you know, the off-quoted, uh, Constituent Assembly speech that Kaidi Azam made, right, saying that you are free to go to your temples, etc. There are many other counters that we could use to say that no, actually, while he said that at that point in time, Pakistan was meant to be an Islamic state. The point is, we chose one, right, and that is the one that's captured within our textbooks. And I think it comes out, the choice was made very early, and I think um, uh, this quote that I wanted to read out to you guys, which is from uh, Maulana Muhammad Akram Khan in 1948 when they're discussing the issue of minority representation um, on the advisory board of education. And he said, and he's talking about at that point in time, all the minority groups, including the Diwan Bahadur S.P. Singha, who was a Christian representative, who were saying that we want to be part of Pakistan as well and part of this narrative as well because we feel that we have more in common with the Muslims than we do with non-Muslims, broadly speaking, in India. And he said, it has been said that the division of India took place on the basis of majority and minority. I oppose this view. The Muslims have never accepted themselves to be in the position of a minority. The division took place on the basis of two nation theory and on the basis of two majorities. Now, it's not just what he's saying, it's the context in which they're saying that there needs to be more minority representation on the advisory board of education. And so he's saying that you cannot say that the position of these religious minorities can be compared in any way to the narrative of Muslims and their position as superior citizens within the Pakistani state. Um, and I think this is something that I felt, at least the Christian community very strongly felt, especially when they were talking about access to education. So I'm going to tell you four little snippets, two of which you can predict on the basis of there being religious minorities, but two of which come from their class position and still affect nonetheless uh, their access to education. Um, one story that was told, and there were variations of it repeated, was of uh, uh, an individual who was actually quite powerful in the sense that he was an advocate, and he said that his daughter was not getting admitted into uh, their local school. And so he went and he spoke to uh, the principal in charge, and he said, why aren't you admitting? He knew, of course, why she wasn't being admitted. He said, why aren't you admitting her? And uh, the teacher said, no, no, I, she can come, it's just the, the classes are too full. And he laughed, he said, Aren't we all Pakistani first? And he says the teacher laughed and said, well, of course she can come in. We are all Pakistani first. I don't think the truth of it is what I'm trying to highlight here. It's the fact that you can make claims on the basis of multiple identities, but your ability to do so is closed down by what the curricula and what is allowed within those educational 
institutions. Um, and a second comparable story to this is uh, whenever we asked about discrimination within the context of schools, we actually got an overwhelming response that there isn't much, right? And maybe that was part of a performance or, or maybe they don't feel it on an everyday basis. But one of the examples that came from a pastor uh, who's very prominent within Lahore was that even when there isn't outright discrimination, the curricula within the textbook, the environment within the classroom is very much that it would be better if you were Muslim. And this can be seen even in the reformed version of the textbooks that under Pervez Musharraf start off with Musharraf's speech saying, uh, speech in the, it starts off with a little excerpt that Musharraf inserted into the beginning of the textbook which talks about how um, Pakistan is essentially for Muslims. And Christians pointed, out, pointed this out and said, if you're saying it's essentially for Muslims, how can you even include us as equals? At the beginning of the conversation, we are excluded in the same way that at the beginning of the National Assembly debates, they were put on a different platform altogether. The other two, which I think are in a way more interesting because there's things that we need to be thinking about. The other two examples, one of which comes from a union counselor within Yohannabad who talked about um, uh, access to education in terms of the problems that kids have with getting uh, birth certificates. And they said that because we're poorer, uh, when it comes to prioritizing the issuing of birth certificates and identity cards, that ends up being a problem within Yohannabad. They keep telling us that the software has to be updated and various delays, etc. as a result of which our children's admission to schools ends up being delayed. Now, we don't think about that, but if that's a problem within this context, the union counselor is highlighting it as one of the things he wants us to raise, then it is very much about access to education in terms of class. And the second, which is perhaps most interesting, segues back into the curriculum, is with regards to what do you study if you don't study Islamiyat? And uh, um, one of the things that, uh, that was discussed again and again was the curriculum of the subjects they are allowed, which are ethics and civics. Um, civics is the one that was talked about uh, most by my respondents. And they said that uh, civics, that there are two problems with it. One is that once you pick civics, you're highlighted as a minority. And that means that all the research that goes into showing how teachers treat minorities differently comes into play at that point when you choose to opt out of studying Islamic studies. And the second aspect, which I found even more interesting, is they said because the civics exam is not made in a more standardized way, I don't know if this is true or not, I'm just quoting my respondents, they said that it's a lot easier to score marks in Islamiyat. And so a lot of people end up picking Islamiyat. So I went back to the National Assembly debates, I thought, is this an older issue? And in 1989, you have, and I'm about to wrap up, no, no. Uh, in 1989, you have a, a Parsi uh, by the name of uh, Byron D. Avari, who uh, talks about how today my two sons are in MBA in Karachi, and he's criticizing exactly this, civics, right? Today, my two sons are in MBA in Karachi. They are forced to do Islamiyat. Why are they forced? They cannot take civics because if they take civics, they will just pass by five marks. Yet if they do Islamiyat, they are sure of 95 marks. So I think maybe there is reason to believe that this kind of problem in terms of access to ed education is something that is also experienced by religious minorities. Um, I don't have an answer of how to tie all of this together, but I do think that this is something that we need to be considering when we talk about religious minorities and the need to reform uh, school curricula in order to include them as equal citizens within Pakistan. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for reminding us that uh, <laughs> textbooks in some ways uh, are a part of the problem. They're not the problem in some ways. Um, uh, Dilshad Abhagar, I'm going to go to your side. Your work is a lot on policy issues, uh, specifically when it comes to gender and so on. Uh, so if you could speak a bit about that, uh, questions of access, uh, questions of ideology and so on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. I think uh, the discussion you have presented uh, in earlier panel is, is, you know, very importantly highlighting, uh, actually calling for a question that, so what happens if certain uh, ideological narrative prevails? So we all know that currently our literacy rates are very low. Uh, in like 56, we were earlier told is 60% uh, overall literacy rate. But then we were told, no, 1970-18, we had 2% uh, uh, going down, which is now 58. So if you look at, I just looked up uh, Pakistan Studies book for, uh, from Synthet's book board this morning, and it was saying that, you know, it's 58, uh, and all the news that tells you. But then uh, women is l little more than 40, and men uh, probably have 70%. So you look at how uh, this 
narrative boils down to access to education. So when we look at how uh, uh, curriculum and textbook, textbooks particularly are critical because we all understand that in public school systems particularly, uh, they, uh, the textbooks are only source of knowledge, which actually teachers as well as you know students rely on. And by no means parents have other resources to contradict what is being taught in the school or you know alternate alter the narrative. I think one, while my research actually, my student research uh, highlights how uh, narrative of uh, religiosity and patriotism actually varies from region to region. If you are very close to the border, so that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, um, patriotism takes really high on priority list. But if you are, go away, it may go little down, but it prevails in your textbook as well, you know, uh, everyday teaching learning process. So you want to highlight this idea that textbook is one important source of teaching learning process, but we also need to look at how schooling is, schoolings are governed, how teaching learning processes are, uh, you know, underpinned by a certain ideology which is cutting across from history into the contemporary times, that is gender ideology. We all know that if uh, today, I, when I was going through the textbooks and there was a figure given, there were statistics given, but there were no questions asking students that why do you think there, is, there are, you know, uh, these disparities, gender disparities in uh, men's and women's access to education? Why there are differences in, uh, you know, men and women's literacy rates? When we go back down to the schools, we understand that, you know, uh, the women, the question of women and girls' participation to the fullest is always negligible. How do we promote that message? Is through our everyday, uh, you know, teaching learning discourse. So, in one instance, when I looked at, uh, uh, you know, secondary school processes with a gender lens, found that, you know, uh, school policies as well as larger education policy has very little to do in form, uh, at, you know, teachers as well as students on equity issues in education. I think this has been, historically, we have not gone away. Although there have been lots of attempts to reform our textbooks as well as our, uh, you know, cur curriculum and teaching learning processes, I would like, like to acknowledge the uh, presence of Ms. Sadka Salahuddin, who I work with closely and, you know, we two together in her leadership, we actually try to bring in this gender equity dimension in textbooks in Sindh and as well as in teaching learning processes. So when you look at the problem and we try to bring in solution as well. So there is a problem. We understand there is a problem. Uh, women are completely absent in uh, your teaching learning processes. Girls are not in schools. Women are not into, you know, they're not present in textbooks. Even the materials display, which are displayed in schooling, uh, schools, we don't see them. What I find very problematic is that, you know, the, the preparedness of education stakeholders to recognize that this is a, an issue. There are, there are ideologically, uh, you know, kind of different premises with many of them not knowingly, knowingly would not leave the turf. You know, we found that in many, uh, in one or two instances, we pr uh, did, you know, kind of extensive review of curriculum. Uh, we all know that now curriculum after 18 amendment is provincial subject. Provinci provinces have certain autonomy and space. And if they use it, this is their space where they can bring in, correct the narrative you know, bring in more uh, citizens' perspective, bring in more equity perspective, but we understand that, you know, it is very difficult to convince that person in a textbook board that there is a problem. So our uh, lots of efforts, those go vain because people, the person who is in the junior in the textbook board or the uh, curriculum wing is not ready to, is not convinced that there is an issue. So how do you bring that change, you know, and... We all understand that Pakistan, uh, all provinces, including Gilgit Baltistan, have uh, were supported by international community to develop their education sector plans. And these education sector plans from 2014 to 18 were supposed to have really addressed the gender equity issues in education. But we understand that you know after four or five years work, we still are at the same point. Very very little has been gained uh, in terms of bringing. Uh, more women's visibility in textbooks, uh, looking at curriculum with uh, your gender lens, and also improving teaching learning processes in the re in, in the in the province here. I will not speak about Punjab, but my experience is within Punjab. We understand that there has been the narrative. How do you change the narrative? I think that is the question that I would like to pose for ourselves. Is that what 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 does it take for somebody to uh, shift that position? And I understand from my work with 
teachers, teacher mentors in uh, rural scene. We it took us four, five to six years to work with those teachers, uh, help them understand the problem, help them understand the concepts of you know uh, gender equity, and then understand what will take to change that concept at, at classroom level. It took us six years to change 50, if not all 140 mentors with whom uh, we work. So I think it's important to see what level of engagement actually these stakeholders have as a result of educational reform. There is not one many that we have gone through. I think the various narratives, but all these narratives actually boil down to lots of discrimination which our children have at the hands of education stakeholders, including all of us. You know, we need to see that what, what will it take to change that narrative, uh, bring more uh, men and women, bring more minority, bring more boys and girls voices into the curriculum, uh, you know, from different uh, diverse you know, socioeconomic backgrounds. Thank you. Hey, uh, 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 Anusha and Kasni, if I can bring you both in. Um, and I'm bringing you both in as historians, and I'm asking this question also as a historian. Um, and for good reasons, obviously, I mean, history um, in Pakistan especially is politically charged, it is contested, uh, it is controversial. Um, um, and, and then for my own experience, I mean, we have three lumps of money, and the best kids come from private schools. This is the best education that money can buy in Pakistan. Um, and even then, I mean, I'm... Uh, I'm astounded at times uh, about the level of ignorance um, and basic um, lack of knowledge. I mean, Abul Kalam Azad ke baare mein baat karna, wo to chale aur baat Jawaharlal Nehru ke baare mein baat karna. I mean, it's it is astonishing uh, just to know uh, or just to find out actually, uh, ke, you know, the kind of books and these are not the official textbooks, yeah. but the kind of books that are being taught even in private schools. I mean, just how silent they are. Mm. Uh, about you know these very important figures uh, of in some ways uh, you know the entire history of our subcontinent. Um, so, I mean, if you could speak about a, a bit about you know that experience and then what it, what it's like to actually not just teach history but also be a historian in Pakistan, mm. uh, you're always up against it in some ways. Uh, uh, no, uh, I think uh, I always say this: uh, people, I think students know about uh, Bhagat Singh only because of Rangde Basanti. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, that's, the, that's the only thing that they know about him. Um, and it's also because, I mean, if you, I, I just wanted to read out this, this National Curriculum for Pakistan Studies, grades 9, 10, 2006. And it starts with, um, you know, it will help answer your question. Okay, broadly speaking, the curriculum of Pakistan Studies is designed to, the first item is inculcate a sense of gratitude to Almighty Allah mm. for blessing us with an independent and sovereign state. Very sure. You know, so that's the, if that's going to be the purpose, yeah, exactly. and so how it's going to, to help uh, fulfill the third purpose, which is encourage states of observation, creativity, analysis, and reflection in students. Right. So, so that's, I mean, the, the whole idea is to, to serve a certain kind of, uh, uh, a certain kind of an um, understanding of history which justifies uh, the creation of Pakistan, its supposedly ideological basis. Um, and I, I, I still certainly believe that the, again, this is uh, replicated in the kind of facilities which are available for researchers in Pakistan, especially for historians. Uh, if you visit any archive in, in Pakistan, you will get to know about it, especially if you go to national archives, that you can get access to Muslim League papers, Jinnah mm. papers, Fatma Jinnah papers, they are available off the shelf basically. You do not have to even put a request for that. But if you, the moment you want to go into any other kind of an area, uh, which helps you explore uh, labor unrest, peasant, peasant movement, or you want to look at uh, colonial records, or even post colonial records, that's off limits. Mm. And that really puts uh, so, so much constraint. Uh, and I'm especially, I mean, I'm impressed with, with both of you because you work on, on labor movements for which... A chodong. You know, huh? <laughs> 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 a five and... Retire on top. So, I mean, you don't have any archive on it. You don't have any material on it. You have to certainly create your own archive for that. I mean, you're going to search for the whole world to search for a document. But uh, the, the region where you work uh, on, basically, where you want to meet, you don't get to meet from there. I, um, so I actually wanted to think about uh, my own experiences teaching Pakistan studies has uh, made me realize one a very basic thing that is missing that almost all our students without exception and if you think about it we also once we left the high school stage did not understand colonization. In fact we were not taught 
colonization. We knew in some way, big way that the British were here. Yeah. Railroads on the Diti was good. And then our main person who we were fighting against mm -hmm. in order to get Pakistan was mm -hmm. the Hindu other. Yeah? And so I think that affects the way that history was written to quite an extent. And this whole, uh, because if you look back and that, I think as a historian, when we look back at those sources, it's so difficult to understand what they were thinking because there was still a residual um, discussion, at least in the late 40s, early 50s, mm -hmm. about how maybe all of us nations are together. You know, the same kind of thing that came out of Bandung and the Tricontinental, that maybe all of us can come together for freedom. That keeps falling by the wayside, and I think this narrative that colonization doesn't matter, the fact that we were under foreign rule doesn't matter, what matters is the problem that we have with India and the Hindu other. And that, I think, ends up defining the discourse in our textbooks and in Pakistan studies to such an extent that it limits critical thinking about anything else. Yeah. Um, this just yeah. one sentence, K. So our narrative is basically anti-Hindu. It's not anti-colonial at all. Yeah. yeah. No, I think this, uh, you raise very important question, how in, well informed our students are today. Mm. And I think whether the, his, the historical discourse, which is actually diversity, and I do uh, think that if they, that diversity, the history in terms of diverse, you know, the, the, its own diversity, if it's brought back to our educational discussion, probably they'll be more informed about contemporary issues they're facing. For instance, I was in the, at Jaudi the other day, and I, two weeks back, and I asked them, do you, uh, there was a group of uh, uh, students who were studying um, different fields in medical profession. And I asked them, do you know if there are 23 million children in Pakistan out of school? They said, no, we, do, we have no idea. So, you know, I think that a student ability to think critically about who we were as larger social group and also who we are as diverse group. And I think it just takes little critical thinking, uh, you know, to understand. And that happens only when schooling processes are actually education processes, resources actually inculcate that critical thinking. You know, ask them to ask questions. You know, I think these are so fundamental from, you know, uh, low, kind of early years to the, to the tertiary education. And unfortunately, there's lots of, you know, kind of uh, ratification of the content, which is, uh, you know, kind of uh, thrown at students. And no question, uh, you know, asked for what is happening to them in past, what happened to them, and what is happening today, how they are concerned citizens in this uh, context. Acha, on that, Acha, Tanya, I just wanted yes. to add, Ejo, uh, because I've taught Pakistan studies, and usme, it's very interesting mm -hmm. because jo our role models, mm -hmm. jo examples jo aapko milte hai, jo people you look up to, whether they're figures of history, mm -hmm. most of them are linked to the military or to some form of violence mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So an example of this was very clearly, and this is a class in LUMS at one point for Pakistan studies, when I asked this, when I asked them, the students, because military ki baat ho rahi thi, ke, okay, how many of you wanted to join the military? Most of them are, are, would want to join the military or the Air Force. I would say 80% at some point wanted to join the Air Force. How many of you are willing to die for your country? All of them. So this idea of, and, and this is, these are students in lungs. How many of you know of figures who were diplomats who prevented war from happening? Because mm. those should be, in my view, should be your heroes who prevented even the death of our soldiers. Hardly anyone. One Nawaz Sharif ka naam niya tha, chup kar so there's also, yeah, your private school, there is this narrative and it doesn't just, uh, textbooks are very important, that's your formal sort of place where you get that, um, the narrative itself, but the way it's also normalized in your learning experience outside the school, the fact that we have an army museum and what that means, so I think it's all of that comes into the way these students are coming from, even irrespective of your class background and sort of you know, privilege you have. Okay, so uh, I've just been reminded that time is running out. Uh, before I come to the audience, Tanya, if you could speak very briefly about what kind of challenges uh, or opportunities uh, are have been presented by devolution and the 18th Amendment. Okay, so um, the first thing is, I mean, every province obviously has its own uh, particular uh, uh, problems, uh, the certain demands that the devolution can uh, 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 accommodate in terms of uh, when a particular provincial board knows, you know, what are the problems of, of their particular provinces, they have control over the budget, etc. The problem, I've encountered more obstacles right now, I have to say, because a lot of 
in terms of budgetary responsibility, in terms of the ability of textbook boards, uh. Punjab is taking the lead in that because that's where you have a lot of investment taking place. Balochistan is really lagging behind because they don't have that kind of infrastructure when it comes to development of textbooks, when it comes to implementation of the curriculum. You see also in terms of an, an example of this which I find very, which I found surprising more because I, I realized this more recently. Jab, uh, APS attacks were the Peshawar ke, uske baad, under the National Action Plan, there was this plan as I initially mentioned, ke resilience or tolerance pe ek narrative aana hai. Punjab Textbook Board did develop a narrative. Initially, it was supplementary material. Problematic, some of those narratives because they were about, um, wo jo ek hai, uh, song about, you know, dying for our country, um, uh, bache, uh, Bahadur Bache, ya Nanna Mujahid, Ehtizaz Hassan pe, those are the narratives that were developed. They have been incorporated in the Punjab textbooks. You don't see any of that in any other textbooks. And this is under the National Action Plan. So you see sort of, I think it also reinforces a bit of conservatism. It also disconnects us with certain figures which are important for our history, but Absolutely. are sort of, you know, taken over by or completely overlooked when it comes to more of a Punjabi dominated or a certain sort of dominated ideal of what you know our history should be. So I think there are problems there. Adil Shah Rabha, do you want to say something about I think one thing that uh, uh, very important, uh, uh, provinces have their own uh, issues and challenges uh, in terms of capacity to bring that reform in. Mm. Use that space which is given after 18 amendment. I do think and that what can really help uh, to bring uh, probably expedite the reform is the collaboration between academia, uh, development organization and research organization. The capacity, I, I, I don't know exactly about Punjab, but we understand that in Sindh and other provinces including KP, they, there's always a question about capacity. I think what is important is that the reforms have to be, you know, research based. All the reform are ac across the world, um, all education reforms are uh, you know, done on the basis of informed, well-informed, good research. So I think that is where that collaboration partnership should actually flourish. I would suggest that, you know, uh, our education department, uh, as an education policy, should have monies available for good research, which is practical, which is pragmatic, which can bring in those solutions uh, to, the, to the stakeholders who really are at the forefront of these educational change. Thank you. Um, so uh, I guess we can take questions on the floor. Uh, we have eminent educationists, by the way, uh, in this audience. Um, so uh, if there are any questions, comments. Uh, I have a comment. There seems to be a collective amnesia about East Pakistan and Bengal. And uh, let me illustrate this. Years ago, we were interviewing lecturers, grade 17. Uh, MA, Masters, and my favorite question used to be, can you please name two Bengali Prime Ministers of Pakistan? They used to look at me strangely, so what is this man talking about? So we have blanked out that entire thing at all levels. So we like to... If I can take like two or three questions at the same time. Yes, sir, your hand is very high. Please give them a hand, please. Thank you. Now, the 18th Amendment and the educational reform has been said that Punjab is the most important thing. I think that the rest of the people who have said that the infrastructural issue is more than what we are seeing from our eyes. One of the Provincial Higher Education Commission has recently tried to curriculum in the curriculum. Uh, they try to print the picture of minority uh, community uh, ki jo place of worship hai, un, uh, unko, uh, publish karne ki ki, uh, in an attempt to tell our children that there are some other people who also go somewhere lekin usko unanimously bulldoze kiya federal government ne uh, aur secondly mere khayal hai punjab government ki advancement ki wajah se hum khush na ho wo usme ideology kya hai they are more aligned toward the toward the central government more prejudiced towards the minority communities ye shayad mera zati taassub ho but that's what i think and i need your comments thank you ab ek teesra ka sawal hum le le inka ji inka inka please inko please aap ki tarah i just wanted to build upon his question how does the creation of bangladesh fit into the textbooks because it essentially invalidates the two nation theory 
काफी नहीं मैं अभी आपकी तरफ आता हूँ अभी तीन कॉमेंट्स का सवाल कर लेकिन Okay so uh, I can answer the 1971 one partially at least uh, because there is obviously something that we've all noticed um, and more than notice I think what comes up most um, if you look at again I can only refer to what I've been researching most recently which was looking at the national assembly debate so if you start from the very beginning and go on till the 50s you suddenly notice bahut zyada enlightened intellectual multidimensional yeah. debates of minorities from minorities because there were a lot of um, east pakistani representatives most of whom were from the scheduled caste and those debates and i'm including people like shri dhrindranath datta we already know now at that point in time that jogindranath mandal was also in pakistan at this point in time and these groups of people and let's remember both datta and mandal were invited by qaid azam to be part of the constituent assembly Um, and Datta, at that point in time, when he was talking against uh, the objectives resolution, for example, or against the basic principles committee report, specifically said, you know, warned the assembly about what would happen in the future as a result of them including this right now. So, in that sense, one of the things that ended up vanishing was the fact that that oppositional weight of a significant minority ended up vanishing politically, and I think that would obviously carry forward into the textbooks as well. um i think that what further ends up happening i'm sure uh, ali can talk to us in more detail about this is that after 1971 there's more of an urge you see this within the works of people like rizana sheikh there's more of an urge to define yourself uh, as a muslim pan islamic who are in outside of south asia more globally kind of identity because the experiment within south asia has failed right both with regards to india and then with the formation of bangladesh and i think that means that you now uh, as state officials and i am imagining as people who write the educational curriculum now have to rethink hmm. how can we make this more islamic so it's a pan islamic identity and not a south asian hmm. islamic identity uh, which i would imagine has you know very problematic repercussions there is a sawal ye bhi ki isko theory kyun kehte hain matlab like <laughs> marxist theory ya yeah, secular theory so tradition theory but i think it's uh, uh, it's the uh, in fact uh, so 1971 allows for a kind of revisionism and it makes things easier to ideologically imagine it as a more cohesive kind of a, of a unit as as anushe uh, pointed out so uh, recently um uh, zaid hamid if you have heard the name so he's this you know yeah. um, hyper pakistani nationalist so he wants to it that Bangla, uh, Bengal was excess baggage, basically, and uh, so it's it's actually good that we don't have that kind of a, of a liability, and uh, and also if you if you read uh, how the separation of East Pakistan is described in textbooks, uh, it it basically you know shifts the blame entirely on to to India to to Hindus to the subversive activities and uh, all of that. So there is no acknowledgement of the fact that you know this is a result of a certain kind of a you know ideological flaw or whatever you want to 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 call it so um, uh, and uh, one of the responses which comes out of 1971 as as ajaz ahmed uh, would say is that uh, so uh, pakistan had to be reimagined not just as as the uh, homeland for the for the muslims of south asia but as the homeland for the good muslims of south asia and that's the the, the added kind of piety or virtue that you find in the post 71 situation Uh, Tanya, do you want to talk about the 18th Amendment? So uh, I completely agree with you. What you're saying, it is true as far as, and hence the examples that I gave from the Punjab text report. It is the kind of reforms you see ideologically are more conservative compared to other provinces. I will say this though, they have been, they definitely have been improvements in the textbooks in terms of. Uh, of making sure that the learning content is a is great appropriate so there has been you know attempts to do that and i think in certain cases they've been quite successful but it's also not easy to make changes to the textbook one needs to remember that it's easy ek dafa jab kuch nikal agar to kuch nikal gaya usko it's best if you can just leave it out in the sense if it's anything that's discriminatory but once you add it back taking it out becomes a problem and an example of this for punjab is is uh, the fact that in 2017 k18 ki jo textbook said they took out some material because they felt it wasn't appropriate for a particular grade they didn't remove it they moved it they moved it to another grade बाद में पता चला दिस वॉज मटीरियल अराउंड मार्टरडम दिस वॉज मटीरियल अराउंड अराउंड द कंस्ट्रक्शन एक एक कॉम्पोजिशन एक स्टोरी थी कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ अ मॉस्क दे मूव्ड इट टू अनदर ग्रेड 
कहीं से ये स्टोरी लीक हुई इट वॉज ऑल ओवर द मीडिया टेक्सट बुक बोर्ड वॉज अंडर प्रेशर कि ये तो यू नो ये वेस्ट की तरफ जा रहे हैं दिस इज एन अटैक ऑन आर आइडेंटिटी टू दी एक्सटेंड कि अगली बार टू थाउजेंड एंड एटीन की टेक्सट बुक्स में वापस आ गई है सारा मटीरियल सो इट्स आई मीन डेफिनेटली यस दे आइडियोलॉजिकली कंजर्वेटिव दे हैव बिन सॉर्ट ऑफ मूवमेंट्स टू इम्प्रूव इट बट ऑल्सो दे आर पीपल विद इन द टेक्सट बुक आर ट्राइंग टू मेक अ थिंग इट्स नॉट दैट सिंपल बिकॉज इज एन इंटायर सॉट सिस्टम Uh, i just want to uh, just want to add uh, you know when you look at uh, reforms in textbooks change of and capacity etc but we also need to understand that it can if we bring those reforms it can actually only address problem to certain extent but if you look at what is the narrative here is you know anybody who is not muslim is clubbed as ghair muslim so when you go to interior since this is good for diverse region and you go you ask who you are kya ke hum ghair muslim hai भाई गैर मुस्लिम है आई यू हिंदू आई यू मुस्लिम क्रिश्चियन आर यू यू नो वट फेर डू यू फॉलो सो द होल आइडिया दैट हाउ दीज माइनॉरिटीज डू नॉट ओन देयर ओन आइडेंटिटी बिकॉज ऑफ देर वर्नरेबिलिटी इन दैट कॉन्टेक्ट इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस टू अंडरस्टैंड एंड जस्ट अदर डे लास्ट वीक आई वॉज टीचिंग इन माई एम फिल क्लास एंड देर वॉज डिस्कशन ऑन करिकुलम एंड आइडियालॉजी and there was a there was a reference made where in a classroom in a school uh, bachcha there was from hindu bachcha was asked to sit on the floor while muslim was sitting on the seat so wo discussion hui ke bhai kyun aisa hota hai hamare schoolon mein to foran wo ek jo hamara mera student tha from uh, interior sindh he actually immediately said uh, ke ye is wajah se hai ke hum sab jo hai wo hinduon se convert hue musliman तो हमारे अंदर जो वो कास्ट uh, सिस्टम uh, है बहुत स्ट्रॉन्ग है एंड ही डिड नॉट रियलाइज दैट इन दैट क्लास वी हैड स्टूडेंट्स हु फॉलोड हिंदू फेथ देवर देवर क्रिश्चियन देवर मुस्लिम ओनली व्हेन वी पॉइंटेड आउट टू हिम ही वाज गुड थिंग दैट ही वाज एबल टू एक्सटेंड दैट अपॉलोजी सेइंग दैट एंड मी टू हर्ट यू बट यू नो हाउ इट इज इट इज इन डीप रूटेड इन आर थॉट प्रोसेस आई रियली थिंक दैट यू नो इट जस्ट इज सच अ ह्यूज चैलेंज that you we are actually confronting when we look at you know that ideological narratives where do you begin the change that is the major question yeah acha ek aur sawal hum le sakte hain meri bas do guzarish aate hain ki ek ke sawal ho dusra ke mehdood ho ji bhai aapki sorry inki hello and this is amanullah san uh, i want to pose this question to the enlightened panel about uh, the question of linguistic human rights and uh, you know question of uh, medium of instruction and uh, uh, how far it is addressed uh, how far do we deal with uh, uh, the linguistic diversity in a the part of uh, education policy uh, and my second question is how far, to what extent uh, we have been uh, teaching and learning fabricated history in pakistan studies how do you see this question uh, mere khayal se ye to humne aap aapka sawal kamra nazar puchna chahe do you have a question acha ji aap puchna chahe मेरा नाम रेहान शाह है देखें यहाँ दो पार्टीशन कर दिए गए हैं तालीम के ना एक कमर्शियल तालीम यानी उसकी वजह से जितना नुकसान हो रहा है एक मैं भी सरकारी स्कूल पीले स्कूल से पढ़ा हूँ और जिस तरीके से अब उसका जनादा निकाला जा रहा है उसी के जगह पे सनत और तजारत के बेस पे जो स्कूल स्कूल बनाई जा रही है उसके उसमें जो तालीम दी जा रही है यानी गरीब और अमीर का फ़र्क बना करके और ये जो सारा डिबेट है ये जो आ, सारी कौमियतों का डिबेट है रियासत की जिम्मेदारी होती है अगर पाकिस्तान एक रियासत है तो एक तालीम का निज़ाम होना चाहिए बाकी सारी बातें जो ना सिर्फ माल बनाने वाली जो ना ये सारे तबके बैठ जाते हैं बोर्ड भी वही बनाते हैं हर कोई अपना बोर्ड बनाया है आर्मी पब्लिक स्कूल ने अपना बोर्ड बनाया हुआ है ब्रिटिश कौंसल ने अपना बोर्ड बनाया है अमरीकन कौंसल ने अपना बोर्ड बनाया हुआ है सिंधी यानी किताब बेचने वाले उन्होंने अपना बोर्ड बनाया हुआ है इसी तरीके से उर्दू उर्दू जो है पाकिस्तान का कौमी जुबान है भाई तस्लीम करो और तालीम दो जर्मन से क्यों नहीं आप लड़ते जी बहुत शुक्रिया आप चीन से चीन चीनी जुबान से क्यों नहीं लड़ते उन्होंने एक जुबान रखी है और यहाँ तकसीम करके हमारी जो ना माइंड को हर चीज़ के ग्रामर को हम पढ़ें पता चला हमारी उम्र ही खत्म हो जाती है चलिए ये लिंग्विस्टिक डाइवर्सिटी पे अगर आप कुछ आ, कहना चाहें तानिया दुलशाह 
एज फार एज आप जो लिंग्विस्टिक डाइवर्सिटी की जब आप बात करते हैं इन टर्म्स ऑफ उर्दू टेक्स्ट बुक्स में क्या बात की जाती है मीन दैट्स वन वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट इट रिसेंटली वहाँ पे अंडर टॉलरेंस के नैरेटिव पे उन्होंने एक स्टोरीज uh, बनाई हैं जिसमें और उसका नाम भी यही है हम मिलजुल कर रहे हैं हम सो दी आइडियाज के और वो दिखाते हैं कि ये डिफरेंट हमारे मेजर जो प्रोविंस के जो फिगर्स हैं जैसे और उनकी जो कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स हैं उनके बारे में बताते हैं मीन दैट्स नैरेटिव इन टर्म्स ऑफ द राइट्स ऑफ डिफरेंट ऑफ अदर लैंग्वेज इन द प्लेस दे हैव इन द नेशनल करिकुलम आई वुड से देर देर एक्सपर्ट experts here who can speak more to this Pun- uh, punjabi for instance is completely as far as the curriculum is concerned completely sidelined ab even yahan tak ki jab kyunki kuch parents se meri baat ho chuki jo low cost private schools se wo bhi kehte hain ki hum bachcho ko chahte hain ki wo angrezi padhe because it's the language of you know wahan se you social mobility in a way the way english is also jo curriculum agar aap dekhe wahan pe clearly likha hua hai ki english is the language for employability aapki curriculum ye kehta hai and aap accordingly fir usko develop karte hain definitely this punjab mein the space given to other sort of languages and identities is very limited as far as the curriculum is concerned i know sin might be different in that sense so i'll let you um i think wo ek sawal jo aapne comment kiya hai na wo important ye hai ki uh, education different social class ke liye different ho gayi wo diversity to hamesha rahegi different provision of education acha bhi hai लेकिन इसका मतलब ये नहीं है कि हम स्टेट की जो एजुकेशन के क्योंकि स्टेट रिमेन मेन एजुकेशन प्रोवाइडर ठीक है कुछ बच्चे जाएंगे इंग्लिश मीडियम स्कूलों में दूसरे स्कूलों में लेकिन ये जरूरी है कि उस पर उसकी क्वालिटी पे कॉम्प्रोमाइज नहीं होना चाहिए और वो हो चुका है बड़े लेवल पे आज हमारे एजुकेशन के जो बड़े बड़े लोग हैं इंक्लूडिंग माई हम अपने बच्चों को सरकारी स्कूल में क्यों नहीं भेजते हैं क्योंकि आप देखें अगर आप ये देखें कि हमारा बजट का जो जो एजुकेशन का बजट है उसका एटी से ज्यादा परसेंट जो है वो सैलरीड बजट है वो हमारे टीचर्स हैं हमारे जो एजुकेशन स्टेक होल्डर्स अब काम करने वाले उनको बहुत सारा पैसा जो है वो तनख्वाह की मद में जाता है लेकिन आप देखेंगे कि वो सबसे बुरी क्वालिटी जो है वो एजुकेशन की वहीं निकल रही होगी कुछ अच्छे एग्जांपल्स हैं जहां पे लोगों ने काम किया लेकिन आप देखें कि वो बेशक वो उर्दू में तालीम हो वो इंग्लिश मीडियम हो तालीम की क्वालिटी अच्छी होने चाहिए वो कंसेप्चुअल अंडरस्टैंडिंग बच्चों के लिए लेकिन ये देखें कि आपने बिल्कुल ठीक बात की कि स्टेट अपना रोल कहाँ अदा करे अदा ये करे कि हमारे बाकी जो भी हो रहा है लेकिन हमारे सरकारी स्कूलों में बेहतरीन तालीम देनी दी जानी चाहिए वो किसी भी मीडियम में हो लेकिन लैंग्वेज को लैंग्वेज के तरीके पर पढ़ाएं अब मैं आपको बात करती हूँ सिंधी मीडियम इंस्ट्रक्शन इज वेरी गुड अच्छा लगता है वो सेंस ऑफ वो है लेकिन जब आप स्कूलों में जाएंगे तो आप देखेंगे कि वो क्वालिटी एजुकेशन नहीं है आपके स्कूलों में जो है एक वक्त में उर्दू मीडियम इंग्लिश मीडियम सिंधी मीडियम तीन तीन मीडियम चल रहे हैं पता चलता है जो बच्चे तो कुछ भी नहीं सीख रहे तो बिग इशू एक तो वो बच्चों को पढ़ाई अपनी जुबान में होनी चाहिए मदर टंग में होनी चाहिए इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट डिस्कशन लेकिन वो क्वालिटी की बात जो है ना वो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है किसी भी लैंग्वेज में लैंग्वेज को लैंग्वेज के तरीके पर पढ़ाए लेकिन क्वालिटी ऑफ टीचिंग लर्निंग प्रोसेस तो वो इट इज एट स्टेक दैट इज अ मेजर क्वेश्चन दैट वी बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन आपने किया जी um right on that provocative question uh thank you so much everyone for coming and could you all join me in thanking our very excellent panel thank you so much for your participation thank you to the audience thank you. Thank you.